Welcome to the Everything Epigenetics podcast, where we discuss DNA regulation and the insights it can tell you about your health. My name is Hannah Went, and I'm the founder of Everything Epigenetics. Today, I have an amazing guest for you. I will be speaking with Dr. Kara Fitzgerald about everything epigenetics. It is really an episode where we dive into epigenetics 101. I was actually lucky enough to interview Dr. Kara about two years ago, um, really talking about her profound study and what it meant for this field. So it's crazy to think that two years ago we were we were having this conversation and everything that's happened in between. I was even um, lucky enough to actually meet her at a conference in New York about about a year back. So it's great to have watched her her growth over the years. Dr. Kara Fitzgerald received her Doctor of Naturopathic Medicine degree from the National University of Natural Medicine in Portland, Oregon. She completed the first Council on Naturopathic Medicine accredited postdoctoral position in nutritional biochemistry and laboratory science at Metametrics Clinical Laboratory under the direction of Richard Lord, PhD. Her residency was completed at Progressive Medical Center, a large integrative medical practice in Atlanta, Georgia. She is the lead author and editor of Case Studies in Integrative and Functional Medicine and is the contributing author to Laboratory Evaluations for Integrative and Functional Medicine and the Institute for Functional Medicine's Textbook for Functional Medicine. With the HealthGut Research Institute, Dr. Fitzgerald is actively engaged in clinical research on the DNA methylome using a diet and lifestyle intervention developed in her practice and one that we will be absolutely digging in today. We will get into all of the weeds and we'll answer any questions you have about her particular diet and lifestyle study, which uses methyl donors to actively lower that biological aging process. The first publication, from the study focuses on reversal biological aging, what I was just mentioning, which was published um, on April 12th in 2021 in the journal Aging. She's published a consumer book titled Younger You, which I highly recommend you check out and read, as well as a companion cookbook called Better Broths and Healing Tonics, and has an application-based Younger You program based on the study. Dr. Fitzgerald is on the faculty at IFM, She is even an IFM certified practitioner and lectures globally on functional medicine. She runs a functional nutrition residency program and maintains a podcast series, New Frontiers in Functional Medicine. And she has an active blog on her website at www.drcarafitzgerald.com. And her clinical practice is in Sandy Hook, Connecticut. I've been eager to have Dr. Kara Fitzgerald on my podcast for quite some time now, so I hope you listen in and enjoy. And now for Dr. Kara Fitzgerald. Welcome to the Everything Epigenetics podcast, Dr. Fitzgerald. I'm so excited to have you. It's great to be with you, Hannah, again, actually. Yeah, I know. It seems like yesterday we spoke, I think, two years ago, both Ryan I mean, Smith and, and myself, we we interviewed you about wow. your, your findings and your studies. So it, it seems like yesterday, but uh, so happy <laughs> yeah. to be working alongside of you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I really want to get the ball rolling here. You know, mm-hmm. there's so many things we can talk about, um, but you're, you know, most people know you from from the study um, that you created. And really, before we get into the weeds of that, I just want to know how this journey started for you. How did you mm-hmm. start to look at epigenetic methylation markers yeah. for your study? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know it's such an it's an interesting <laughs> it's an interesting story. It's interesting for me, even I like I sort of like telling it because it was a bunch of serendipity. I mean, I had the fortune to do postdoctorate training in laboratory science, and our lab was kind of, it was a clinical lab, um, you know, advanced in, at that time, you know, it's going on probably 15 years now, but we were the first clinical lab to re, to release a DNA um, stool analysis. So we were using PCR uh, to look at uh, the microbiome, and it was the first test out there available to uh, to clinicians of its kind, and you know, it was it was like it, it was like we had stuck our toe into the omics revolution, which now you know you guys are are in the middle of. But we were we were sort of in this precursor place, and I think it just it gave me a pr- an appreciation of you know the science as it was moving, and that was during my training 
Um, and I continued to just really be interested in what was happening in our ability to sort of see into the epigenome, the ge- you know, the genome, the microbiome, the metabolome, the proteome, et cetera, et cetera. But I was also, but I'm a clinician, you know, I'm a clinician mm-hmm. by training. And so I'm working with patients and there's, so just toggling, how can we translate what we're seeing happen in the science um, into actionable information? And it was about 2016 to actually that was when we released the methylation and diet and lifestyle. So it was, it was around 2013, 2014 that I was tucking into the literature on epigenetics. And, you know, the best studied of all of the epigenetic marks is DNA methylation. Um, you know, and that's the placement or the removal of a, of a methyl uh, group onto a, the promoter region of, of a, of a particular gene, you know, it's denoted in the literature as these these red lollipops are really kind of, I think it's kind of cool. And so when there's a lot of red lollipops on, you know, on a promoter region of a gene, that gene's effectively inhibited from being transcribed and those lollipops can be kept from being placed. So inhibited from placement or actually actively removed and that that gene can be uh, turned on, activated, transcribed. Um, so I started to tuck into the literature at that time on, epi- on, on, on epigenetics, mostly DNA methylation and mostly in cancer. Um, so the tumor microenvironment very effectively takes over epigenetic expression from us for its sort of own nefarious growth. So it will inhibit tumor suppressor genes. It will hypermethylate and shut down tumor suppressor genes, you know, a lot, you know, inhibiting their role of protecting us from cancer, and it will turn on oncogenes and, you know, other genes that promote cancer. So it gets into the mix and does, you know, and and manipulates methylation pretty aggressively. It manipulates other epigenetic marks as well, but, but best studied is methylation. And, you know, when I was reading this, Hannah, um, I had, you know, my overwhelming question as a doctor was, you know, we know in functional medicine that we're influencing methylation. We're no, so, so those red lollipops, we make them in something called the methylation cycle. It's a very nutrient demanding cycle. B12 is involved, folate is involved, choline, betaine, you know, a handful of minerals and other vitamins um, are players in the methylation cycle. We can, we can get an idea of the functionality of the methylation cycle by measuring something called homocysteine, which, you know, a lot of us have had measured uh, when it, you know, it's been most characterized around cardiovascular disease and elevated homocysteine is associated with cardiovascular disease. But we also know that it's associated with problematic methylation at DNA, in, in, in the DNA. I mean, you know, so it's more, there's, it, 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 it's a surrogate marker for more activity than just, you know, what's happening in um, cardiovascular function. Uh, and we in functional medicine know the methylation cycle. We know how to ma- manipulate it. We know how to play with methylation in our in our patients, uh, and it's a key piece of what we do and what we analyze. It's only with the advent of epigenetics, of you know DNA meth- being able to really look at DNA methylation, you know that we can ex- begin to see that what we're doing here in in the methylation cycle is influencing DNA methylation. And so when I was reading those papers back in the day, I had to wonder, you know, could there be any circumstances where if we're pushing methylation forward, if we're really moving that methylation cycle by giving people lots of B vitamins, um, could we be negatively influencing, say, you know, someone who has a precancerous process happening. You know, could we be, could we, could, could our methyl donors, could our B12 and folate actually be, you know, influencing, turning off those all important tumor suppressor genes? Right. And that was one of the first big questions that I had at that time. And it, you know, and it niggled me enough with some other pieces, you know, it, it, there were other things going on. It wasn't exclusively related to cancer, but it, 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 it kind of bugged me enough that we embarked on creating a diet and lifestyle to influence, you know, DNA methylation. We, we, we decided we wanted to really change course. Um, and that's what we did. And I think on that journey, and I know I need to stop and, and, and hear <laughs> from you, but on that journey, we realized that, you know, these lifestyle interventions you know, are as impactful. It was, it was, it was just an awakening 
uh, experience that we ended up getting to study and, you know, really has kind of changed the trajectory of my career. But that's the nugget of how it all started. Yeah, I, I find that just so interesting. And you said a couple of things there. Number one, you mentioned the omics revolution. We are living in that. Yeah. I, I love and and yeah, when when we, we are living in this revolution where we're taking in all of these multiomic factors and actually being able to apply them in terms of clinical decision making and clinical care. And I think it's great, you know, that was almost seven years ago, back in, in 2016 when when you really questioned, you know, are these molecules actually, you know, maybe hurting or influencing this methylation process in a way which we don't want them to. So I think yeah. being able to challenge the status quo and, and say, okay, let's back up a little bit and, and let's really dive into what these markers may mean. You know, without that critical thinking, we would never be in this spot today where you, you know, that MDL program, so to speak, almost turned into that younger you program that you have now and yeah. that most people really know you by. So I think, yeah. you know, people need to ask the right questions, challenge what is available, because that is really how this, this science succeeds. And, and that is why I, I just find your program so interesting, even more so because it's just solely based on that diet and lifestyle factor too. So it's not like yeah. you're asking people to spend a bunch of money or to put you know, a ton of time and effort. People are busy. People are so busy. Time yeah. is the most precious, um, you know, um, uh, value that that one can give. So, you know, we don't we don't have time to to you know go and, and sit in a, a hyperbaric oxygen chamber for you know hours on end. You can actually shift these methylation markers in in your favor by following a couple of you know, by following your Younger You program. So I'm just really excited mm -hmm. about the work you're doing and super thankful for you to be in this space and you know have you to look look up to and follow. But yeah, that's it's that's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, well, you know, we can go back to Randy Journal and 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 Waterland and their seminal work in the early two thousands, demonstrating the power of nutrients and changing, you know, the agouti gene and you know turning it off and turning those blonde obese mice into you know brown wild type, skinny wild type mice. I mean, and see the potential of nutrition's influence on the on the genome, and so. It's awesome to be a part of that conversation where we're now looking at what's happening in humans and seeing, wow, yeah, in eight weeks time, you can really change gene expression, you know, as measured through DNA methylation. I mean, it is, you know, it's extraordinary. It's extraordinary to have to, to, to be in this revolution and to have these tools to be able to look at with that, you know, that that level of detail. And the other kind of extraordinary thing to me is the juxtaposition between being in the omics revolution where we can we have this new this this new exquisite insight that's only expanding, you know, when we move into multi-omics tools. But what I'm studying is old school nutrition mm -hmm. and lifestyle interventions. It's very it's sort of like from from where we came and then but we're putting the the lens of this, you know, incredibly modern uh, time that we're in on what, you know, a very old school intervention. So that's, that's a cool juxtaposition in, in my mind as well. Yeah, definitely. And I love that you bring up Dr. Journal's study. I, I spoke with him a, a couple of days ago, a couple of weeks ago, actually, but it's been 20 years. It's it's the, you know, 20th year anniversary. So, the, yep. Um, yep. you know, thinks it's almost time to write this epigenetics in, yeah. in review, this this really nice review. And I said, do it. Mm -hmm. I said, we need it. We would love that yep. Um, yep. And, and need an update. From him. So, you know, I want to point the conversation and uh in, in a space that's become very popularized right now, right? There's all these trend words in, in this in this space, you know, to name a few things like biological aging, there's health span, there's lifespan, longevity. Why are all of these so important right now? How do those relate back to your your younger you program? And, you know, you can see them in, in hashtags and in every Instagram post now. Can you talk a little yeah. bit about that? I know. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's pretty neat. It's pretty exciting to see all the attention that this field is getting. It's a little bit, you know, it's a little it's a little crazy in some ways, but it's 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 very, very exciting as well. So biological age is the rate our bodies are, you know, physiologically aging at, you know, and um, we can measure it. You know, we can measure it looking at these patterns of DNA methylation. You know, there's a number of different clocks um, or you know, the, the, the pace of aging, the do it in pace of aging um, tool that you guys offer that, or that True Diagnostics offer that we're using now as well. There's, so there's ways that we can look at, we can look at certain DNA methylation patterns that reflect the rate of physical aging. And that doesn't necessarily correlate with chronological age. So we can be aging 
faster physiologic than physiologically than our chronological age that or we can be actually aging slower and that was you know the first piece that we looked at in our research um, was whether or not our study participants biological age changed um, in our eight-week intervention and so we had a control group too which is really which is amazing because I know a lot of the studies well I think more recent studies are starting to have controls but you know this right. is a new field um, so as compared to our control group without any intervention our study participants slowed or reversed bio age over three years 3.2 to four years um, and then the within group comparison was around two years actually they're themselves at baseline as compared to the um, after the eight weeks yeah soup really interesting and you know again hannah like i came to this conversation in 2016 you know through the lens of of thinking about cancer epigenetics and and and, and through the lens of functional medicine and that's why we created this multimodal modal intervention in 2016 as you know we didn't think biological age reversal was possible, right? It was not possible. There were no, there was no evidence in the literature, no studies, nothing had been published demonstrating such a thing would happen. We were starting to have the clocks, like, you know, uh, Horvath's flagship uh, multi-tissue clock was out at the time, but um, I wasn't holding my breath that we reversed bio age. I, I was, I was, I was, I was pretty confident and perhaps cocked you know, cocky, like, but I, I thought that we would change gene expression. You know, I was, I was reasonably competent, by confident that, but because we were looking, you know, looking at the epic array that we, we might really see some change to gene expression. But even then there was scant evidence in humans. I mean, my, my, I was leaning heavily on in vitro research and animal research. It's like scant evidence in humans. I mean, it wasn't that long ago. So our study was well underway when the TRIM study was published, when the first study showing bioage reversal was actually published. We were underway, and it was to massive fanfare, as you know. It was like time stood still for a moment when that study came out. Right. Um, and then ours was, you know, maybe the maybe the third after that. I think the vitamin D study came out. But um, we didn't anticipate reversing BioH, we wanted to look at it as one of our, you know, it was an exploratory endpoint. But man, I have to tell you, it was incredibly exciting when we, um, you know, when we learned that we had made a difference in the Horvath clock. Um, so we're in this era now where we can see that we've got some say over how fast we're aging. And that's incredibly empowering. I think for some people, it's funny, you know, Jeff Bland was, was, was telling mm -hmm. me that you know, with with this power, it comes great responsibilities. I, I think there's probably some people who are who are are disappointed that they're really in the driver's seat of their own health. You know, but for most of us in this space, we're incredibly excited that we can make a difference like this. So, so we can right. slow bio age down, and by doing so, we can extend our health span, which you know really needs to 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 be shouted from the rooftops, and perhaps extend our lifespan. You know, we already we have a pretty good lifespan, but the quality of our life and, you know, in, in, in the United States, but really around the world is pretty horrible. Lifespan does not track with health span at all. So the first thing, you know, knowing that we can slow biological aging would be to match up lifespan and health span together. So we have this nice, robust quality of life. Um, you know, and then secondly, yeah, maybe extending these out further, you know, as well. Um, but we're at this ex very exciting time where we're paying attention to this in a way that we haven't before at all. I think eventually much focus, much centered focus will be on the aging phenomena and how we can slow it down rather than siloing, you know, disease investigations. Let's look at cancers over here, neuro neurodegeneration, neurodegeneration is over here, you know, um, Diabetes is over here. Heart disease is over here. They're all siloed and separated, but they are all the classic chronic diseases of aging. If we focus on aging as a whole, um, you know, we may really, really uh, impact all of these and, and, you know, impact health span. You know, it just, I mean, the, the, the power of that transformation, uh, I mean, not just the cost savings, but just the the quality of life, like just the change to humanity. I mean, it's just the un, the, the possibility is absolutely extraordinary. And it's an all hands on deck activity. Like all of us are needed 
to change this paradigm. Like we're, we're all needed. Um, so I'm just, I'm, you know, I couldn't, I'm just excited to be a part of it. I, I couldn't agree more. And it's funny that you mentioned, you know, a lot of us are excited to be in the driver's seat, but some of us may not be so excited, right? Because they don't want to control for things that they now know they can control for. So it makes for a really interesting, you know, health shift or paradigm. And it, again, is, is crazy just how much knowledge and, and we're finally understanding how this process works, because I believe you know, there will be some changes in the next coming years where maybe aging will be recognized and, and really defined as a disease because it's this outward projection. It's this primary cause, right? All of those disease phenotypes like the diabetes, the arthritis, the, um, you, you know, everything you just named there, those are, are an outwards projection. Those are secondary of from aging itself. So I will think I, I think you'll see this huge change and this huge trend that leads more toward the preventative care. Right. Because, again, that's going to, you know, yes, cost savings. We could go into yes. all the benefits of, of, yes, yes, of yes. really focusing and, and changing yes. that preventative. Care. I, I have to say, I'm not sure I'm in love with the idea of aging as a disease. I mean, it is kind mm -hmm. of provocative and maybe we need it for the, you know, the NIH, the powers that be to sort of train their lens and billions and billions of dollars on aging. Maybe it needs to be boxed like that. But, you know. I, t I talk about this in the end chapter of my book. Wisdom happens on the aging journey as well. You mm -hmm. know, I am in my 50s a better, calmer, you know, more, I think, I don't know, more loving, more sophisticated. Like there, yeah. are, there are certain oh, yeah. things that have happened um, in my aging journey that are actually net benefit. And I and and we we want to be mindful about honor respecting this you know and and i i this is this is tangential but mm -hmm. plenty of people are probably in line for their yamanaka cocktail and <laughs> it, i would say that one needs to think carefully at you know at what information is going to be wiped away <laughs> with this yamanaka cocktail so it, yeah. it I, I i mean it's so i understand your point from a um uh, from a from a um epidemiological standpoint but um, but there's other information right. going on in the aging journey that we that that, that we want to respect. Oh, for for sure. I think you know maybe like logistically or or book definition. Mm -hmm. I don't know. You know, again for for reasons for the grants and different things. Who knows where yeah. aging will go or if it will be defined as a disease? But a, again, I completely agree that aging is beautiful. I don't. You know, aging always has this negative connotation, and that is something we can now, you know, slow the progression of because it's more about the health span. Yes. I know I don't want to be 60 or 80 years old and not be able to walk to the bathroom or take my dog yeah. on a walk. You know, I love That's animals. Right. I want to be able to have animals up until, you know, the, the rest of my <laughs> life. So it's if, if we yeah. can extend that health span, I think we can almost shift even that conversation about aging, you know, gracefully or, or having yeah, a yeah. more positive connotation. Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. I'm being, I guess I'm like getting up on my, I'm being kind of provocative because no, I do, I, I mean, I do I think is, I think, yeah, I think it's, yeah. I mean, I think, I, I think that it's an important conversation. It's an important thing to kind of throw in the ring in this, in this dialogue. Definitely. Yeah. So I, I want to um, bring it back into your, to your study. I want you to tell us a little bit more about that because I think, again, people are so attracted to it. They yep. are, are finally knowing that they can make changes just based off of lifestyle. They are in the yep. driver's seat. They are in control. You hear those things like, you know, your DNA is not your destiny or, or food is medicine. So yes. can you give us some insight into, you know, the protocol, the mm -hmm. plan um, in each of yep. those, you know, respective categories? Yeah. So it's a, you know, the diet is, um, you know, it's a, it's a recognized healthy eating pattern. We built, we built it brick by brick to influence DNA methylation. Um, it's packed, it's actually very veggie dense. There's about seven to nine cups of veggies a day. Um, cruciferous, lots of greens, colorful, you know, fruits, ber uh, berries are in there. Um, it's a low glycemic plan. Um, there's animal protein. Eggs are, are, you know, methyl donor superstars, very rich in choline. Uh, animal protein, I think is important, particularly liver. Liver is a 
is a multivitamin in a food matrix, so liver's included. We do, by the way, in the book, I did create a vegan version for people who don't do animal products, but, but we didn't research it. This is what we researched. So dense in methyl donors, dense in folate and B12, choline, betaine, you know, beets are in there. Um, you know, the full complement of B vitamins. Um, and then there's this whole, a ton of what we call uh, methyl, methylation adaptogens. So these, so methyl donors and these methylation adaptogens um, are, are epinutrients. All of them have some evidence in the literature that they influence epigenetics, that they influence gene expression. And really, by and large, it's DNA methylation. The bulk of the science is on DNA methylation. And as I say in the book, at the time, most of it was in vitro and in, in, in animal studies, but they influence DNA methyltransferases or 1011 translocation enzymes, the enzymes involved in turning genes on and off. It's pretty awesome. So we packed the diet full of these. Uh, it's low glycemic, as I said, a gentle intermittent fasting structure, 12 hours on, 12 hours off. It's keto leaning. Um, we wanted some background ketosis because ketones, as you know, are all, it can influence uh, gene expression as well, favorably and potently. They're potently anti-inflammatory. Um, so that was the diet arm. And these, and these polyphenols, actually, just to circle back in case anybody doesn't, yeah. uh, isn't familiar with them, are things like curcumin and, and turmeric, green tea, you know, catech the, the EGCG and other catechins in green tea, um, luteolin in, in tomatoes, resveratrol, quercetin, you know, and on and on and on. In the book, one of my most favorite parts is the nutrient appendix. It's 30 pages of these epinutrients, of these things that can influence gene expression. So, you know, many, 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 many foods in a healthy whole foods diet do, do that. And we just packed them in. We just packed in as much as we can. Yeah. It turns out exercise is an epinutrient also. <laughs> exercise really, as you know, influences DNA methylation and, and epigenetic expression, you know, big time. In fact, there was a pretty cool paper that came out arguing that the way that exercise works as magic is through influencing epigenetics. Um, epigen it, it exercise acts like these polyphenols that I just mentioned. It's And when you're looking at epigenetics, it's extraordinary. So exercise was in there. Yep. And um, we wanted to do something around stress. So the, liter the data on stress uh, I think is gasoline on the fire of aging journey. Uh, oh, the, yeah. um, it, it, the toxic influence of stress, and we can actually inherit some of this, mm -hmm. um, can negatively influence gene expression and push aging, the diseases of aging, inflammation, and so forth. So we, we brought meditation into our, our program as well. Just a very simple twice daily breathing exercise. Um, the research on meditation, on Tai Chi, you know, on, on yoga, et cetera, just like exercise shows it to be potently active in terms of favorably regulating gene expression. We wanted people to sleep. We can't make them, but we, you know, we supported them with <laughs> sleep hygiene tips. <laughs> Good sleep is essential for health span, lifespan. Um, and again, there is literature showing that insomnia, and this is, in, this is human data, pushes biological age forward. So it, it, yep. it accelerates the aging journey when you're not sleeping. Um, let's see, what else did we do? We did, we gave people a greens powder, so extra of those all important epinutrients. We gave people a probiotic, a, a specifically a strain that we thought might increase gut production of folate. So a healthy microbiome produces basically a multivitamin. If we've got a good gut, a lot of those nutrients we need for gene expression are going to be made right there. And we did, so there were no B vitamins, so just, just the probiotic yeah. and the greens powder. Um, and we did increase circulating folate significantly, circulating specifically methyl folate in our participants as compared to the controls. So, right, that, so it's all that about these the natural, you know, these, these natural additions or, or removals of, of those methyl groups, right? Yes, just giving the body all of the ingredients, like all of the information to um, do what it needs to. It seems like, I mean, my idea, so my working hypothesis is that we need lots of methyl donors. We need to be able to make those red lollipops. Um, so we need a B, B vitamin dense diet and we need supplements sometimes as well. I am not at all anti-supplement when it's appropriately <laughs> prescribed, but it seems like we want to couple 
that methyl donor information that we give the body with this polyphenol information that we give the body with the green tea and the curcumin, et cetera. So it kind of, I think that it may direct where methylation is happening towards a healthier, more youthful um, pattern. Gotcha. Yeah, I know. I love that you hit all of those, you know, target areas like the exercise, the sleep, the diet, um, you know, the probiotic, yeah. the greens, the the stress, which mm-hmm. when anyone comes to me and ask me, you know, their number one reversal or like you said, it's pouring, it's like pouring gasoline on, on the fire, the data yes. behind you know, stress levels and the increase in biological aging and shifting those methylation markers to not be in your, in your favor is substantial. So the yes. last time I know I've, I've had increased, you know, biological aging before, I'm definitely due for, for another retest, but I completely denote all of that to, to stress. So Do I have been doing yeah. some, you know, Good. meditation, relaxation responses. It only takes, you know, start out with 10 minutes. That's what I've been doing at night, right? So, awesome. and, and trying to build that up little by little. And I really liked hot yoga when I was doing that too. I just think it just is so calming for the body and the mind. So something I'm personally trying to work on to help, awesome, you know. Anna. Yeah, well, I think it's, a, I mean, I think it's important, you know, that, that you share what you're doing um, and what, you know, and what yeah. your struggles are. With, are. Um, for me, doing the book launch, I mean, here I am in Mexico. We're living here now for a couple of months, and I can already see my heart rate variability increasing. The, for the bulk of the, the early, most intense part of the book launch, I was, I was, I was, re- I was great. I did, I did well. But by the end of mm-hmm. 2022, man, my heart rate variability really tanked. <laughs> Even with good right. self-care habits, I think just the intensity, the demands of that, of that journey. Um, oh, oh, definitely. Yeah. Do, do you um, have a wearable then or, or how yeah. are you tracking? Okay. Yeah, oh, you have I have an aura. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. And I, never, I love it. Never done a wearable. I'm getting the, the whoop here soon. We'll, we'll see what oh, happens, cool. but I'm Good. yeah excited to track a little bit. And then again, you know, kind of micromanage some of those, those, those outputs and yeah. see how I, I can be a little bit better. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, just summing up your your study, can you round it out? Tell us uh, what you found. You know the the exact reversals again, and then that that time frame. I know that's over mm-hmm. over that eight week period. Why mm-hmm. and, and tell us why that's such a big deal, and and maybe the most surprising finding for you. Yes. So we did the diet and lifestyle intervention for for eight weeks. We had a we had a we had a study group of 18 um, individuals and then we had a control group and they obviously the controls didn't do anything. Um, and the study group followed the diet. Let me actually, we'll follow the whole program. And the study group had contact with our nutrition team, which mm-hmm. I think made the, this study successful. They met with, mm-hmm. they were required to meet with a nutritionist at least weekly uh, for the first month and then as needed thereafter. And most, most of them just continued right along with the nutritionist. I think that that made our adherence data awesome like they Mm -hmm. these these guys really stuck with the program um yeah that's great we may we may look at publishing that yeah i know nutrition you know program uh, interventions in general are kind of notorious for you know having compromised data and i think we did a pretty Mm -hmm. good job because the nutrition involvement so it was that eight week diet and lifestyle intervention plus the two supplements that i mentioned the probiotic and the greens powder um and we looked at the epic array. Um, so that's, you know, about, you know, close to a million methylation sites. And the first thing that we looked at was the Horvath clock, which, you know, when we started our study was really the only one out, amazingly. And we mm-hmm. collect in saliva. And so it, we needed a multi-tissue clock. And so we looked at the Horvath. Um, and yeah, it was, you know, it was pretty extraordinary <laughs> to see that we, <laughs> I mean, I remember it. I remember it like it was yesterday when, you know, when I learned that we had made such an impact on, on biological age in our, in our group as compared to the yeah. control group and even the within group comparison. Um, yeah. It was very exciting. And now, uh, well, and I think actually just talking about the whole journey of writing the paper up and then putting it into peer review. And, you know, one of the reviewers just said, this is something that we can all do. As to your oh, point, wow. when we started the conversation, like this is broadly adoptable. This isn't going, this wow. isn't having hyperbaric or IV therapy or access to, you know, a CRISPR cocktail or some of the biohacking things. This is having a reasonable access to reasonable food, you know, and engaging in some very doable exercise. Um, 
it's not a rocket, rocket science intervention at, at all. That's so amazing. It was. It was really exciting to get that comment from <laughs> peer review, and it made me sort of more motivated in wanting to move to writing it for consumers. I mean, mostly I've been an educator of other professionals in my career, um, not you know in the in in the consumer space. And this, but this was motivating. I mean, I think this is very reasonable information that we should. You know, we just needed to get out there. Yeah, just just so amazing. Um, I, again, can't you know love love your study more with with that age reverse. So I couldn't imagine you know seeing the initial results and thinking, is this real? Is this actually happening? Right? And kind of the you know yeah. the, the way it changed your your life trajectory and your course. And and now yeah. you know consumers all around the world know about your study and they're changing their lifestyle because of you. I just think that is that is so motivating. It's huge. It's that revolution we're, we're undergoing. So it makes me just so happy. <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, I know. Yeah, likewise. And you know, yeah. I'm really excited for our coming papers. Like yep. I was, I, we were talking offline about, um, we influenced, so the, the Horvath clock we looked at is only 353 methylation mm -hmm. sites. And, but I know we influenced many, many, many thousands more methylation sites and that's going to be our yeah. next so we're move, we're going to move away from the bi so the biological age investigation is huge and we're we're you know we're, we're continuing to look at it and we'll refine our intervention and you know i'll keep as you said it's 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 a career change for me and i'm, I'm really focusing on it um but we also changed a heck of a lot of other genes and that's oh, going to yeah. just be really fun to look at and 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 tease out and publish on and and hopefully that'll be coming out you know come down the pike very soon yeah, and and what are you most excited about? That's that's coming. Would it be that study? Do you do you have any any other things that that are I on am. the on the pipeline? But there's a lot that I'm pretty excited mm -hmm. about. So yeah, <laughs> tucking into so continuing to look at our intervention. We've got a case series in review now. Um, looking at the other genes that we influenced and understanding them, and um, I think individualizing the program now um okay. sort of we we have this core intervention that we studied um which is which is good but what if you know what if i prescribe it for you and for your metabolic needs you know what if i tweak it a little bit for the person sitting in front of me which is what we do in functional medicine it's what we're really good at this individualized sort of the systems investigation you know, very individualized. So we take the principles that we've figured out in the Younger You program, and then we further ind individualize it. Like, what kind of findings might we see then? You know, what kind of findings might we see if we layer in some of the supplements um, coming down the pipe that we're, we're pretty jazzed up at? Like, what if, I mean, oh, wow. a really simple one, vitamin D, right? I mean, vitamin D, I think, is on to its third paper showing bioage um, reversal. I, oh, yeah. you know, just, I, I just, love that. Yeah. Just because you, you have the, the baseline, like you said, we need to start somewhere. Your, your original study is great. It provides insight on, on where someone can start mm -hmm. because then you have your baseline. You, you go on this, um, you, you know, your, your program, your, your younger, you, um, you get your results back, you know, let's push the limits. Let's get even younger. Let's, let's get even <laughs> better. Um, so then, yeah, personalizing it a little bit and really having that end of one precision based medicine, which is exactly what healthcare providers like yourself are, are diving into. I think that can be even super interesting as well, because, you know, the dosing may be different. Someone may need ABC, someone may need XYZ. So I think that could yep. be an interesting approach as well. I do think it's, mm -hmm. it, it would be interesting. And then of course, if I had funding, it would be nice to do a larger Right. study using our original protocol or if you know if another i know i was some 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 scientists reached out to me from china not too long ago and we're going to take this on but covid slowed it down you know it would be i'd, I'd love to collaborate actually you know i've talked quite a bit about different collaboration opportunities and i would i would just really love to do that yeah definitely all starts with the funding so <laughs> yeah you know it's a lot it's, it's like clinical research <laughs> Yeah, it's it's incredibly expensive doing a randomized control trial. It, it just oh, is. And and I don't think people realize how much you know work up front goes into that, right? On yeah. on the back end for you know my company, True Diagnostic, I've seen the work that's being put in into a lot of grants because I've you know proofread some of them and, and have gone through. Yeah. And now I really understand when my professors in college would say, you know, no office hours today. I'm writing a grant or something. I'm like, what? You know, 
know, surely yeah. it's just a little paper, but I mean, it's just it, so Huge. much goes into this. So appreciating yeah. the, the view from the inside out is, um, yeah, something I have a whole new lens for. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. It's a massive, massive undertaking and the duration, like, yeah, we're, we had an eight week intervention, but it took us over a year. You know, we had to have a mm -hmm. rolling recruitment. Um, mm -hmm. It took a while for the, the right people to come along who are willing to adhere for the, mm -hmm. for the eight weeks. And so, yeah, we didn't, we started, we started recruiting in 2018. Maybe we were works. We started with IRB in 20, late 2017 recruiting in 2018. We didn't finish until 2020. Right. Yeah. I think patient recruitment is huge too. Right. So, yeah. you know, getting, getting people involved in, in the right type of people, you have the inclusion, the exclusion criteria. Um, yeah. You know, and it, and yeah. I think we wanted I, I healthy wanted, men. Yeah. It took, yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And I think it's great. Um, I forgot to mention that your um, people who were actually in, in, in the group who were performing the therapy, they got access to those nutritionists. I think that's phenomenal. Um, yeah. and, and something that's really unique about your, your study. And again, the control group, because those first couple of clinical trials that like, came out proving the reversal of the biological aging or other aspects, um, they don't necessarily have a control group. So that's something that's extremely unique to, to your, um, you know, research study too. Yeah. I think we're just really fortunate. We have you know, we had, we had good funding. Right. And, and we're just scratching, scratching the surface. Um, so, so excited for what's to come in, in your new studies. I'll definitely keep an eye out. I'm sure I'd, I'd Thanks, gonna have you on, on again, you know, here in a couple of years when, when you have another just great, great paper and something we need to talk about more. So we've, uh, yeah, come to the, the end of this amazing podcast interview, uh, for the listeners who want to connect with you, um, where can they, where can they find you? And I'll definitely put this in the, the show notes as well. Awesome. So you can, we have a free biological age quiz, which is really kind of a fun way to enter into the conversation for yourself. Uh, and you can access that at youngeryouprogram.com. So you can find our bio age quiz. You can actually access doing a bio age test with a nutrition consult through that, um, that website as well, which is, which is pretty cool. You can talk to Very one of our cool. nutritionists who's, you know, well, well trained in our protocol. Um, and then my website, drkarafitzgerald.com, is where the podcast is that I do and, you know, where information on our clinic and blogs, et cetera, et cetera. You can find all that information over there. And an amazing podcast. I would recommend anyone listening to, to this one to go give give hers um, a listen. And then um, my my final, final point, this is a curveball question I give to everyone at the end ah. of my podcast. If you could be any animal in the world, Dr. Fitzgerald, what would you be and why? <laughs> oh my God, that's really, really funny. Um, I mean, all right, I guess I'd have to be a naked mole rat, right? Oh, <laughs> there you go. And so, if you're wondering why I picked that, I have a blog on it. I wrote a blog on naked mole rats a long time ago, but yeah, they're badass, right? They live yeah, forever. Yeah. They don't get any cancer. They, you know, they're, they're, they're incredible little uh, subterranean rodents that are, that are pretty, uh, ugly, but man, they lived a good life. I love that you picked that animal. No one has said that yet. So it's very unique. Well, I will dig up your blog post and put it in the show notes too. So people who are thinking, cool. what the heck? Um, can, can have a little bit more insight. You can see a picture of a naked mole rat. Yeah. Isn't that funny? Yeah, no, that's, that's great. So we'll, we'll see if anyone else uh, gives me that same answer because yeah, I mean, that, that's the, the point living, living forever and, and, you know, no, no cancer. So um, no, I really appreciate it, Dr. Kara Fitzgerald. Thank you so much um, for your time, and we'll talk soon. All right. It's been a pleasure. Thanks.